Members are welcome to this meeting of the Ad Hoc Committee on the COVID-19 Response. Before I move on to the agenda, could I first welcome the Minister, uh, Carol McKillen, to her post. And I'm sure all members would join with me in wishing the former Minister for Communities, who I'm sure will soon be the Minister again, a very speedy recovery for her recent illness. Agenda item one is the minutes of the proceedings of the previous meeting held on the 25th of June. Members are asked to note these minutes, which are at page three of your packs and which I have agreed. Members also should note that the minutes of evidence from that meeting have been published in the official report and are available on the committee's web page. Agenda item two is a statement from the Minister for Communities. The Speaker received notification on the 3rd of July that the Minister wished to make a statement to the Ad Hoc Committee at today's meeting. A copy of the statement that the Minister intends to deliver is included in your pack at page 7. Once again, I would like to welcome the Minister for Communities to this meeting of the Committee. Before the Minister makes her statement, I want to remind members that following it, there will be an opportunity to ask questions, not make speeches. Members who ask short, sharp, focused questions will be invited to ask a supplementary if they wish. Members who engage in long preambles, however, may find that they do not get to ask a supplementary. I ask members for their cooperation, and I will, of course, be asking the Minister to return the favour by giving succinct answers. I invite the Minister to make her statement, which should be heard without interruption. Minister. Thank you, Prew Last can call you. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker. And I'm very uncomfortable standing with my back to you all, but this is my first meeting in a partner. This is the way it works. And I, I'm also noted that we were well and truly slapped there before we even start. So without further ado, I wanna thank the committee for inviting me here today. Um, this is my first ad hoc committee. I'm proud to carry on the good work which my colleague Deidre Hargy has been doing. And as we begin to move now from COVID response into recovery and renewal, it is a great opportunity for me to update the committee on my department's ongoing work to support our vulnerable communities and households through this crisis and beyond. It goes without saying that my department's swift and decisive response would not have been possible without the dedication, hard work and cooperation not only of my own officials and those in other departments, but also our partners in the voluntary and community sector, councils, sporting bodies, faith-based organisations and the many grassroots groups and community workers who work with each other and with my department to put in place a real practical solutions and supports for those in most need. I'm sure you will join with me in thanking them for the difference they have made and continue to make in responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. Members will be aware that in the June monitoring round, the Department received COVID-19 allocations of 88.8 million, comprising of 66.1 million previously agreed by the Executive, and 22.7 million allocated against new bids of 24.7 million. At this early point in the year, it is anticipated the COVID allocation will be spent in full. As we move into the recovery phase, it is vital that my department's financial and staff resources are directed to delivering upon my longer-term strategies, strategic priorities, while at the same time continuing to respond to the immediate needs of vulnerable people. One of my department's early interventions uh, in partnership with Advice NI was the establishment of a free phone COVID-19 community helpline. This service is still available to ensure that the most vulnerable and those at risk of COVID-19 have access to practical support services and emotional support at this most difficult time. My department also made a significant number of emergency changes to social security benefits. These changes include both operational practices and legislative changes. All face-to-face -face PIP and DLA assessments, as well as attendance allowance reviews were paused in March, initially until June, However, given the ongoing social distancing requirements, I have extended this easement to safeguard people's health and safety while ensuring that my department continues to provide the most appropriate support to disabled people. I will continue to keep this position under review and my officials are due to meet again with the advice sector 
to keep them updated and to brief them, brief them of, on next steps. At the outset of the pandemic, my department put in place measures to provide financial easement for those with a benefit related overpayment or loan due to COVID-19 and around 90,000 cases were adjusted, which went some way to help alleviate financial pressure during the emergency period. Our rolling approach will be adopted for the restarting deductions from this week, beginning with off-benefit deductions and with all deductions expected to be back in place by autumn. In terms of making financial assistance available to people here, a total of 17 sets of emergency regulations relating to Social Security and discretionary support have been made by my department in a compressed time frame. To reflect the change in public health guidance as COVID-19 lockdown measures and Chilean advice is eased, amendments have been made to statutory sick pay to ensure that it continues to be available as, financial, as a financial safety net for individuals who are currently shielding or if any future periods of shielding could be, should be needed. Strategy sick pay has also been amended to support the executive's contact tracing strategy, helping to ensure people follow self-isolation advice if recommended. This is an important measure to provide an incentive to individuals to follow public health advice, keeping people safe and protecting our health service. Access to food remains a critical element of the emergency response. Working collaboratively across departments, health and social care trusts, council, councils, local community organisations and the private sector, my department put in place a programme to distribute food to vulnerable people across all communities. My department has invested £10 million in this service and over 184,000 food boxes have now been delivered. Access to food was further bolstered by putting in place arrangements for those shielding to get access to priority online shopping delivery slots with major retailers. The Food Box initiative was set up as a short-term emergency response to support the most vulnerable and will continue to those shielding and in critical need of support until the 31st of July. Arrangements were also put in place to help ensure the safe delivery of medication to vulnerable and isolated people who cannot arrange for anyone to collect their prescriptions. These vital services ensure that those in most need in our society who do not have a support network of family and friends to help them through this emergency have had access to basic food and medical supplies. It, it also allows those at risk of social isolation to see a friendly face and know that we as a society have not forgotten about them. There is a tremendous amount of goodwill and generosity and action across our society, which is particularly welcome at this challenging time. There are a number of other strands of the overall emergency response programme that relate to food support, and my department has provided financial support to councils to deliver directly or to enable the very important work of local and voluntary community organisations at grassroots level. To date, 1.5 million was distributed to voluntary and community sector through councils, which included an element for food. My department has undertaken a review of the overall access to food programme with the aim of supporting a more sustainable approach to help those who need help to access food. The department will be providing an additional investment of up to 875,000 to Fairshire, a national network of charitable food redistributors to deliver an increased supply of food to community food providers. In addition, the pilot programme with social supermarkets has shown positive outcomes to date and has been extended to allow consideration for a full programme to be rolled out. This reflects the value of wraparound supports alongside access to food, as well as offering a possible platform for pathways to employment. The department is currently developing a support developing a support and business case with the aim of having the appropriate network established by October. In the longer term, the Department will factor in the findings from this emergency programme into the development of the overarching anti-poverty strategy to include a clear set of actions on food poverty. My Department has taken the lead in responding to the challenges that community and voluntary organisations face 
in introducing a range of flexibilities in terms and conditions around grant funding, including advancing six months funding for salaries and running costs and reduced bureaucracy. To enable this to happen, my department has prepared the necessary contracts for funding and paid out over £13 million in grant payments, excluding the councils, to just under 400 organisations since the 1st of April. The councils received £4.36 million. This was funded via the Community Support Programme at £1.32 million, the COVID-19 Community Support Fund at £1.5 million, Advice Services at £0.89 million, and welfare reform at 0.65 initiatives. I was able to announce on the 1st of July that additional funding of 4.5 million has been secured for the COVID-19 Community Support Fund, on top of the 1.5 million released in April, which has enabled our councils, our local councils, to directly support grassroots organisations to help those in greatest need. I am grateful to my colleague, Minister Hargey, who launched the COVID-19 Charities Fund on the 15th of June 2020. 180 applications to date have been received, requesting funding totalling, totalling 4.5 million. 38 grants have been distributed, totalling 643,000. And in addition, 340 applications are in progress. And this would suggest that the total spend will be around 10 million although the position will become clear when the fund closes for applications on the 10th of July. I will update members on the final position, and if the fund has a remaining balance, I will present proposals on how this will be spent. I have to commend our delivery partners, the National Lottery Community Fund, who have risen to the challenge of getting money speedily to the bank accounts of hard-pressed charities. This week, I heard firsthand about the impact of this emergency funding and I'm delighted that my department has been able to support Action Cancer with a grant of 75,000. This, this will also be greatly appreciated by 850 women who have been anxiously awaiting vital cancer screening. I am conscious that other sectors are facing significant challenges at this time. Following the initial announcement of a 1.5 million COVID-19 creative support fund to enable artists and creative practitioners and small to medium institutions to work on new projects. I have now also announced a further four million. Work is ongoing to assess where this will be best spent and to establish the requirement for recovery of the sector moving forwards. Following the announcement on Sunday of a further 33 million pounds investment in culture, arts and heritage institutions, I will be making a strong strong representations to my executive colleagues at the earliest, earliest opportunity on how this money should be spent to support the local arts, culture and heritage sector, which has a vital role to play in keeping spirits high and promoting creativity in these difficult times. I recognise that sporting organisations at every level, from grassroots to those who compete at an international level, are facing serious financial challenges as a result of the COVID-19 restrictions. My department and Sport NI have supported the sports sector by providing both financial and practical advice. In terms of financial support, Sport NI immediately paid the sports governing bodies grant due to them under existing lotteries programmes. We also launched the Sports Hardship Fund with a fund of £1.245 million, which will enable 620 clubs to receive a grant of 2000 to assist with essential maintenance costs for their facilities. I have recently secured a bid of £2 million through the June monitoring round, which will be used to continue to support those clubs, governing bodies, sporting organisations experiencing hardship as they move into the recovery period and help and helped the sector build resilience, capacity and capability moving forward. In addition, Minister Hargey made the case for clubs to be included in the eligibility criteria for the 25k hospitality, retail, leisure and tourism scheme. And this has enabled around 80 sports clubs to benefit from that funding. On a practical level, Sport NI has developed a portfolio of advice and guidance for the sector, which is available online, aligned to the executive's five-step plan and is based on medical and scientific evidence. The department and Sport NI continues to provide 
support to the sector as it takes gradual steps for a safe return to sport as restrictions ease. I am very conscious that the impact of this crisis on construction and on tourism has created a very significant challenge for the heritage sector. My department cares for 190 state care monuments and I am pleased that we have now reopened these sites where it is safe to do so. We are also working closely with the wider heritage sector as it looks to the future. The retail and hospitality sectors have been hit particularly hard by the coronavirus crisis and the road to recovery for them presents a particular challenge. With the executive announcing the easing of restrictions for retail and hospitality sectors, guidance for urban centres green spaces was published on the 29th of June to provide owners and operators of public spaces, including councils and landlords, with information and examples of measures that may be undertaken to adapt and manage public spaces in order to help social distancing. The outdoor spaces close to hotels, bars, restaurants and cafes can be used by these businesses to deliver their services while ensuring the safety of both staff and customers and keeping under consideration the impacts of measures on people with disabilities and other groups. My department owns a number of sites within town and city centres which have been acquired for regeneration purposes, for example, Bank Square and Blackstaff Square in Belfast. It also owns a number of civic and public spaces in city and town centres, and we have made these available where this is helpful to support safe queuing, social distancing or spill-out spaces for cafes, bars and restaurants. Minister Hargey wrote to the Council Chief Executives on the 11th of June, outlining how the Department was working to support town and city centres in their recovery and encouraging councils to make more use of the existing pavement cafe legislation. My officials are currently finalising a business case for a revitalisation programme to support our towns and city centres to recover from the impact of COVID-19. I also recently announced 300,000 support fund for business improvement districts so that they continue to play a key role in bringing local businesses and other stakeholders together to help them regenerate their areas and to improve their local trading environment. Turning now to housing, my department continues to provide assurance to households facing difficulties in paying their rent. We received initial commitments from both the housing executive and all of our housing associations to treat such cases with extreme sensitivity. Minister Hargey also postponed the housing executive's rent increase for 2020-21 until October this year, as well as strengthened protections for private renters during the COVID-19 crisis through the introduction of legislation, which requires that private landlords give tenants a 12-week notice to quit period. My department has also produced guidance to assist tenants and landlords, both social and private, to remain safe and secure and comply with obligations while observing social distancing guidelines. These documents are hosted on the DFC website, NI Direct, and linked on the websites of partner organisations such as Housing Rights, councils and housing providers. They are regularly reviewed and have and will continue to be updated as COVID-19 arrangements evolve. Like Minister Hargay, I am also very aware of the impact that the restriction on house moves was having on many households, with many individuals and families being forced to live in unsuitable accommodation as they were prevented from moving into more appropriate housing. Housing officials worked with colleagues across the executive and experts across the housing sector to analyse the evidence and produce guidance to permit the housing market to reopen from the 14th of June. Of course, this action was only made possible because of the progress made over the last few months in reducing the spread of the coronavirus here. In this context, it must be emphasised that the reopening of the housing market does not represent a return to normality. The process of finding and moving into a new home is different. Everyone involved in the process has, has had to adopt practices and procedures to ensure that the risk of the spread of coronavirus is reduced as far as possible. This includes doing more of the process online, such as initial virtual viewings, use of appointment systems and strict infection control procedures before, during and after viewings. With these new practices and procedures in place, the house moving process is as safe as it can be, and this has allowed households to re 
um, commence or start the process of looking for a new home. In her statement to the COVID-19 Ad Hoc Committee, Minister Hargi outlined the importance of protecting the homelessness during this crisis. The Housing Executive set up a dedicated team to manage their response to this crisis and has put in place a number of interventions to support homeless individuals or those threatened with homelessness. The Housing Executive has now drawn up an exit strategy which will assess and evaluate the measures they put in place to address homelessness during the COVID-19 outbreak and consider what long-term strategies will need to be put in place to support those who are homeless or threatened with homelessness in the long term. I will continue to take all possible measures to prevent vulnerable people from sleeping on our streets, and I would commend all of those who have worked with us to make sure that they are kept safe. Additional funding of seven million has been allocated for the homelessness, which has allowed the housing executive to deal with the initial surge and will allow it to take a more long-term actions as we go through the recovery process. I would like to acknowledge the joint working with the Department of Health, which provided funding to the housing executive to provide accommodation for the homeless individuals with no recourse to public funds and ensured that these residents were protected from contracting COVID-19 and enabled them to comply with government guidance on shielding, self-isolation and social distancing. Executive colleagues approved £10 million in funds for the Supporting People programme, which along with the unfreezing of £3 million in Supporting People restricted reserves, which will be used to address staff shortages and mounting pressure in this area. This funding allocation represents my commitment to the vulnerable people in the Supporting People schemes and the staff providing support to them. We support them and we are working hard to ensure their safety and well-being. I also want to acknowledge the very quick response from our Finance Minister in allocating uh, £3.5 million to be used for the procurement of PPE for single commission Supporting People schemes. Our partnership with councils has been vital in responding to this crisis, and I am well aware of the financial pressures facing them, as they have lost practically all of their self-generated income, while much of their operational expenditure and, in particular, staff costs remain. While £20.3 million was allocated to councils for quarter one of 2020-21 to assist them with their financial pressures as a result of COVID-19, as we move forward, my department continues to work very closely with councils to identify the continued financial pressures and constraints arising as we move through the various phases of recovery. It is clear we cannot expect that council finances will return to pre-COVID-19 levels immediately, and I have asked that officials look at council pressures for the July to September 2020 period. Councils have highlighted concerns about any potential economic downturn with resultant reduction in the rates and the rates base and how this could have a significant longer term impact on the financial sustainability of each of our councils. Finally, as we move out of the response phase and plan for our recovery, it is important that we build our operational resilience in preparation for any further wave of COVID-19 or any other disruption to our business and plans remain in place to enable the rapid scaling up of contingency operations should this occur. My department has taken considerable steps to support staff during the emergency response to the COVID-19 pandemic through the provision of ICT to enable them working from home and ensuring that office buildings across our estate are safe for increased numbers of staff to return. I am committed to working with executive colleagues across the executive and local government and with our stakeholders and partners to ensure we face the challenges in a cohesive way with the well-being of our citizens, our communities and our economy at the heart of all of our decision making. I thank the committee for their attention and I am happy to take questions. Gormila Mwagov. Thank you, Minister. Before I call uh, the Chair of the Committee for Communities to ask her question, I want to remind members I have 21 names on my list. If everyone asks two questions, that is 42 questions. Question time on this statement will allow roughly 60 minutes. So do the maths and you see the need to be succinct. I call the Chair of the Committee, Ms Paula Bradley.
Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and can I also join with you in wishing Deidre Harvey the very best wishes, um, because uh, from a purely selfish level, we want uh, this minister back in our committee again pretty soon. Uh, minister, you spoke there about the £20.3 million that was allocated to councils, and we know um, even if councils are able to open up, um, a lot of their self-generated income was, was um, subsidised by ratepayers into the bargain. So I just want to ask you, have you had any conversations with the Minister of Finance um, around the estimated penny product and the, the uh, rates guarantee is what councils have been asking for when they last briefed us? I thank the member for her questions. Um, my officials are working very closely with all the local governments and you'll know even from the committee, the committee give a fairly good presentation. They're looking at the next quarter from July and September. They're also liaison with colleagues and right across the executive piece to ensure that we provide the appropriate and I suppose speedy support to councils because I think it's accepted that all the opportunities to raise their own uh, revenue are practically defunct during this period. So they're basically, they have done a due diligence for the first quarter. Uh, they will be doing the same due diligence for the second quarter uh, to see what the actual spend is needed and what we can do with them to ensure their um, sustainability through this period. A supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer. Um, and I absolutely agree. Your department has worked very closely with the councils, and we saw that in any of our briefings that we have got from your department. I just want to ask you then that, given the statement released by the Chief Executive of Belfast City Council last night on the problems that they're facing there, um, just when do you feel it would be appropriate, if you haven't already, um, get involved with that council and steering that forward? Well, I, I, I seen the statement last night and I've heard some of the commentary today. Um, I will be talking to my officials to see what action, if any, um, I can or what action, if any, is appropriate to take. Um, Belfast City Council have had difficulties for a long time um, and certainly um, the statement was very concerning um, and I do think that, you know, I need to be careful about what I can do and for that matter what I should do. And I would urge all council leaders in Belfast City Council, despite difficulties, to come together because Belfast, um, a council that I was uh, a member of from 2003 to 2007, has come through many difficulties and we just need to knuckle down and to see what we can do collectively. Hopefully, um, that will be sooner rather than later. Sinead Ennis. Uh, Mr. Principal, De Deputy Speaker, and I'd like to thank the Minister for her statement today. Um, Minister, in your statement, you alluded to the recent allocation of the £33 million for the arts, culture and heritage sector. Um, could you elaborate slightly on, on how best you think that could be spent and what, are, what initial discussions you're having? Um, well, I know that £33 million for some, um, some of the commentary that I heard isn't enough. Okay, so I know that uh, there's many sectors that um, would certainly uh, appreciate uh, an injection like that, but there has been uh, certainly some commentary in relation to how it should be spent. I also noticed that the Arts Council have a survey online asking artists and creatives to um, feed back to them how it should be spent. For me, the, the statement was very clear that it needs to be spent on arts, culture and heritage. I do think we need to look at, particularly around free, freelance artists, creatives, um, particularly artists uh, and um, musicians who could not get access to any benefits during this crisis at all, who didn't get access to um, universal credit or indeed any discretionary funds. I personally think we need to look at a, a hardship fund to help those people, because that in itself will help the economy. And then we do need to look at some of the venues not just in Belfast, but right across the board, about how that money is going to be used. Ms Ennis, for a supplementary. Thank you, um, and I concur with the Minister's comments, because we know the, the issues affecting the arts sector predate COVID, and um, you know, the year-on-year -year reduction as a result of austerity had, had huge impacts on the arts sector. So I would just urge the Minister again to make the case to executive colleagues that across the executive we need to fundamentally change the way we view the arts. Yes, they provide entertainment, but they're also skilled highly skilled individuals and people um, who deserve some sort of stabilisation fund, as you, as you have alluded to, um, in line with, with what the hospitality and other sectors uh, were able to access during the COVID crisis. Thank you. 
I don't think there was a question there, Minister, but if you want to agree with what your colleague said, I'm sure that's... Totally agree, Sinead. There you go. <laughs> Mr Mark Durkham. Thank you, Mr Principal, Deputy Speaker, and it's good to see uh, you back. I'd like to thank the Minister for her statement and commend the work of herself, her predecessor, and her department at this extremely challenging time. I'd like to pay particular tribute to the many volunteers and groups who have been a lifeline in their communities. Could the Minister outline if she intends to, along with ministerial colleagues, look at how some of those voluntary groups outside, who fall outside of normal DFC funding streams, such as neighbourhood renewal, can be supported with their core costs that enable them to do their vital work? Thank you, Member, for his question. He's, he's been very consistent in this. I am currently looking, while there might not be a budget headline in the Department for particular funds throughout this COVID crisis, there certainly has been money made available. And I'm currently looking what additional support that we can get in because he's right. There are groups who have done vital work outside of neighbourhood renewal or areas at risk um, that need to be supported. So I'm currently looking at that as well. Mr. Durkin. Thank Minister for that answer and that commitment. There hasn't been a renewal of the small grant for volunteering this year. Now, over the past four years, this small grant has enabled some of these uh, small groups and organisations to keep their doors open and their lights on. Would the Minister concur with me that it seems perverse that at a time when their value has never been more evident or the need for them uh, as great, that these groups cannot now avail of this vital assistance? Well, as I said um, to the member, the, the, the groups have applied through even different routes within the department and even through money the department has put into other ALBs and even other councils and have applied. Um, I do think the volunteering sm small grants programme that was launched in, in I think 2013 was very successful. Um, I do think it's something I'm going to be looking at in terms of an anti-poverty strategy because some of that work, particularly around volunteering, needs to be reflected in that. I also know that um, last year the department allocated 521,000 um, and it was distributed to 60, 662 organisations. Um, so um, that is evidence that a small bit of money goes a long way and has a great outcome for people. Mr Andy Allen. Speaker, and at the outset, can I declare an interest as a charity trustee? Minister, you've outlined and you provide a very helpful update in relation to the COVID-19 Charities Fund, and I appreciate you can't preempt at this stage, but you've outlined that you suspect it to be a £10 million scheme overall, given that there was £15.5 million allocated initially, and it was dedicated towards a charity scheme. Can you outline, do you have the flexibility to uh, reprioritise that within your department, or will that be repackaged for the charitable sector? Actually, Andy, I think it's going to be a bit of both. So whatever additional funds are there, I mean, like the lines I have says, whatever remaining money will be reallocated. The indications are that there won't be remaining money, that I might need additional money, given what we're done, and even possibly linking to the question that Mark asked around volunteers, because a lot of those charities have volunteers and voluntary schemes that have been helping people for years. So I think it's a question of whatever monies are will be well used, and we may need to try and look for opportunities to get additional funds. Mr. Allen, for a supplementary? Don't require a supplementary. Ms. Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank you very much, Minister. I would just like to take a very small, a quick opportunity to say thank you to you and all your staff, in particular those working in the front line jobs and benefits who behind the, schemes, uh, behind the scenes have helped so many through this. But I just wanted to draw you back. You talked about the revitalised programme to support our towns and city centres to recover from the impact of COVID, and in particular, you've talked about helping through the pavement cafe type system. But I'm very aware that in rural areas, it's very difficult for that pavement cafe to be facilitated. Can you outline what you're doing, um, perhaps, with other um, departments on that? Well, I thank the member for a question. It's very timely because Minister Poots and I are having a meeting this afternoon. So we're looking at the revitalisation. I'm looking at the revitalisation programme for 5,000 and above, and he and I are both trying to look at what else we can do for 5,000 and below. Minister said at the committee yesterday, um, some villages don't have footpaths to put tables and chairs outside, but it doesn't mean to say they don't need support. So that's the sort of initiatives we're looking at. I'm, I'm already working with Minister Mullen in terms of local councils 
and their development of licensing regimes around um, cafes um, at this time and to use whatever open spaces we can. Uh, we're also trying to link with the economy to try and help those small businesses and give them every opportunity to ensure that their businesses, I suppose, flourish under these circumstances as much as possible. Ms Armstrong for supplementary. Thank you very much, and thank you, Minister. Um, I'm just going to use my second question to draw out another aspect, which is sport, and just ask you for clarification um, on the £2 million that has just been allocated, when that will be announced, and when there will be an update on the contact training in groups for up to 30 people. Well, I'm hoping the announcement, last point first, will be because we had an executive meeting today, which wasn't that long finished. So obviously easements are going through, so I don't want to preempt any announcement coming. So certainly we looked at that. Um, in relation to the £2 million, I would anticipate an announcement being made very, very soon. Um, we, did, uh, we did ask for more money. We didn't get it. Um, but certainly we'll be looking at opportunities for, for in future monitoring rounds and indeed any other opportunities to try uh, and get some money, particularly out to the grassroots organisations. Mr Jonathan Buckley. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. The Minister will be acutely aware of the impact of COVID-19 on the housing market, which in turn could place further stress on the social housing stock. One of the most alarming aspects is the impact on first-time buyers in Northern Ireland, where the four main banks are asking for higher deposits, making it virtually impossible for them to get on the housing ladder. Will the Minister agree to engage earnestly with both the Economy Minister and Finance Minister and present the United Front meeting with banks to encourage greater flexibility and a return to low deposit mortgages? I certainly will give the commitment and any um, commitments I give will be in earnest. Um, I do think that even just watching the news last night, on one hand you had an announcement from the British Treasury potentially about um, stamp duty and then you have other announcements which would appear you're getting up one hand but it's getting taken off another and particularly um, some families who had the opportunity to move into a home have now been priced out of it, and that's something that none of us want to happen. So certainly any opportunities, I'll um, take it up with executive colleagues after today to see what we can do. Mr Buckley. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Continuing on the theme of housing, the Minister will be aware of the Chancellor's announced Green Recovery Scheme for Home Insulation in an attempt to stimulate local growth post-COVID-19. Has the Minister considered extending this scheme to Northern Ireland homeowners? Well, the, it was a, an England only announcement, as far as I could see, and it's certainly something that we would like to see some foreign consequentials from. Um, any you know, green schemes and certainly retrofitting and anything, it's not only benefit people who are living in fuel poverty, but also help the construction industry, particularly in new methods of construction, would be welcome. But as of this morning, um, I was looking through the papers and seeing that it was an England only announcement and that we had yet to benefit from any Borna consequentials. Ms Gemma Dolan. And I thank the Minister for her statement. Um, I welcome the Minister's comments in relation to overall anti-poverty strategy, including direct learning um, regarding access to food. Can the Minister provide an update on the progress of the development of the anti-poverty strategy? Well, I met with, I think I spoke to the committee yesterday, but certainly meeting, had met with officials from coming in the department and had a webinar with a lot of groups who were involved in the emergency leadership group who literally went through, I suppose, from the 20th of March, um, all the emergency arrangements and central to that and acknowledged by all those people was the work that the grassroots groups did and within the community. Um, of getting the food and, and all those supports out. Um, that, they all said yesterday that that sort of being able to scale up and scale down and help neighbours who are really vulnerable has to be reflected in an anti-poverty strategy. And I would concur with that um, because we've all heard well-used phrases, particularly in winter time, about heating or eating. You know, that needs to be something that an anti-poverty strategy tackles head on. I thank the Minister for her answer and um, I look forward to working with her on that. Um, you touched briefly on this, um, but an issue in many of our homes is fuel poverty. Um, and I'm just wondering, could you provide an update on the Affordable Warmth Scheme? Well, the, I mean, for example, there, there are lots of great ideas and lots of policy developments out there. We've all been lobbied by many of the people. And because we're getting lobbied doesn't mean to say all the lobbies come to us aren't good. However, we need to make sure that people live in a house that they can afford. 
live in a house not only can they afford to rent but they can afford to run. And we need to make sure, particularly for people who are on low to middle income, that they are facilitated as much as possible. So certainly that's something that we're looking at and hopefully we'll be bringing forward in the autumn. Mr Mervyn, story. Thank you, Mr. Be tarnished and damaged by the actions of our friends and colleagues in West Belfast last week. Uh, much in this statement around social distancing and keeping the law or keeping the rules and so on. And it will detract away from much of the good work that has been done by the department. Would the minister be able to give us a breakdown today of the 10 million uh, that was referred to in the statement, uh, uh, which has provided 184,000 food boxes? Would she be able to tell the House geographically what is the spread and the breakdown of that particular amount of money? Before the Minister rises, I would say she should answer the question at the end, because the introduction did not directly relate to her statement. So it is simply the question about food boxes, I would say. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. That is exactly what I was going to do anyway, and I am sure Mervyn knew I was going to do that. So, um, but. But I don't, I don't have a breakdown geographically. But I think we'll get, we need to get one, um, because it, it, it is important that level of support um, is reflected across. Uh, I, I, just to g give the member some assurance, um, the people who are shielding because of medical reasons, that is the criteria. It's not a political or an ideological criteria. That's what it is. So, but I will endeavour, and I, I suspect um, that this will take um, some time uh, getting this information broken down from GPs, because I've had difficulties even as, even as an MLA. Some of the constituents, I'm sure we all had this, didn't actually get their shielding letters until you know, a lot of weeks ago when they should have had them a lot longer. So I'll certainly endeavour to get the member that information. Mr. Story? For that, we look forward to seeing what that is. Also, in the statement, reference is made to the work of the housing executive in terms of uh, the homeless and vulnerable. She will be aware that there are considerable concerns in regards to a property uh, in East London Dairy constituency in Port Stewart, uh, which has raised public concern. And it, right, it comes out of the fact that there is a, an absolute shortage of properly structured and properly provided uh, support at living. Will the Minister ensure that in conversations with the Housing Executive that that particular type of provision will be made available, as clearly we see there is a need for that at the moment? Thank the Member for raising that. Um, certainly under supporting people, and he will know even from his tenure in this department, it is much needed funds to do a lot of work, particularly for those of us within our families and communities who are really, really vulnerable. What we do not need to do is put people in further jeopardy or make them even more vulnerable into a property that will actually perhaps endanger them, both emotionally, physically or mentally. So I, um, I think I'm aware of the property that the member's talking to. I'm happy to talk to him afterwards, because I would be um, very willing to go to the housing executive to ensure that there's more appropriate accommodation to suit some of the people who need our help the most, and what we don't need to do is put them somewhere that's going to put them at risk. Mr. Cathal Boylan. Corner, just on the Minister's mention, strengthen protection for a private rental sector, and I'm just wondering, arising from COVID, does she intend to further develop protections and regulations for the private rental sector? Um, thank you, Member, for his question. In short, the answer is yes. Um, it is a priority. It was a priority for Minister Hargey, and I'll continue on with that. I think all of us benefited from um, during the, the start of the, the emergency that when the legislation came through, particularly about the notice to quit, the extension of that, that helped, um, given the fact that there is more housing benefit paid into the private rented sector and there is a social sector, we need to look at stronger and further in some of those regulations, both to protect the tenant and indeed the, the landlords who want to be good landlords and offer good protections for their tenants and their property. Mr. Gordon. And could I thank the Minister and just on, on, in light of that, would the Minister agree certainly that there needs to be a big rollout in terms of social housing to give people an opportunity of ownership 
and also what's the time frame for rolling out some of those regulations? Well, we're going to come back to look at um, further rolling out of the, the legislations, and I'm aware that um, I think at the start of the week it was the first bit of legislation that was brought forward by communities. It wasn't done under accelerated passage, so we do need to, and that was pension scheme bills, so it wasn't to do with housing, but we do need to look at that. Um, I mean, the answer to all this, I'm not saying private rental sector is bad, public sector is good. I think we need a blend of both, but one thing that we all agreed on is that we need to have more social housing. Um, we need to increase the supply to reduce demand because, unfortunately, there has been inconsistencies within the private rent se sector. There's no security of tenure. The conditions and standards that people are living in aren't as good as what they would be in the social sector. And we need to have better and stronger regulation of the private rented sector. I call Ms Sinead McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr. Principal, uh, Deputy Speaker, and can I add my appreciation um, to, to the Minister for her statement today and, and to the work that her department has done throughout uh, this pandemic. It has been uh, very well received in my community. But um, one of the things that I, I want to raise, um, in February, um, your department uh, stated that it was targeting resources to ensure that they engaged with those furthest away from, from um, work and those um, in, in lowest uh, employment, those uh, constituencies that have lowest employment rates. You will be very well aware that my constituency um, ha has very, very high uh, levels of economic inactivity. Almost a third of our working population um, are, are economically inactive. And it's also exacerbated because of COVID. Um, can the Minister please tell me what she is doing to, to support um, those that are unable to work uh, for, for economic and activity rates in the Foyle constituency, please? Well, the member will be aware that um, a lot of the kind of face-to-face -face, um, support that um, people who were particularly long-term unemployed was just cancelled through COVID, but some although it wasn't restored at the same level for teleconferencing and, te and telephone calls. Um, there are many reasons why people are unemployed, as a member will know. Some is because there's regional disparity. Uh, others will be because there's either physical and or mental health problems. And thirdly, um, is because the investment hasn't came in order to create jobs and apprenticeships on a consistent basis. Um, so she will probably be aware of uh, the announcement that was made around apprenticeships and I We'll be working with my ministerial colleague, Diane Dodds, to see what we can do in a joined up way to ensure that particularly those who have experienced long term economic deprivation get an opportunity to make that change. Can I thank the Minister for her answer? And I totally agree. And there's lots of reasons for economic inactivity. But some of the reasons for economic inactivity is bad policy as well. Childcare policy and social care policy uh, create barriers uh, to employment, particularly for women. Uh, can I ask the Minister, will she um, agree to, to have uh, cross-departmental, because it's to the Department of Health, the Department of, for the Economy and the Department of Education need to tackle economic inactivity. It is really pushing down our productivity in Northern Ireland uh, because it's extremely high, the highest of all the regions in the UK. Thank you. Um, I will certainly commit to do that work and I endeavoured even at the webinar meeting to look at particularly um, the budget process. Um, given the fact that you know, we've heard about gender uh, imbalance, we've heard about imbalances within the economy, depending on where you live. We also all agree that we need to have a, a robust childcare strategy as part of that, because you, uh, you can't offer an opportunity for people on one hand and they can't avail of it on another. And then, you know, ironically, get sanctioned because they won't take a job that they really can't afford um, and they, can't, they don't have access to childcare. So, absolutely, um, we'll be working with health and education, the economy on this one. Mr. Mike Nesbitt. Chair, thank you very much. Could I first of all just check some figures with the Minister in terms of the arts and sports? I'm seeing pots of uh, 1.5, 4, and 33 million for creative industries, culture, arts, and heritage. Sport gets 3.2. 245 plus 2 million from the hospitality and leisure pot. So is that 38.5 million for the arts, 5.3 million for sport? Well, the member will be aware it's a, it's a very attractive figure, particularly if it's in front of Belfast Telegraph tonight. But the member will be aware that the 33 million came as a result of a statement 
as, as a result of Barnet Cons Consequentials. If I could split it up and help other groups within my department, it would, but it's not the case. Uh, and as I said, um, I think it was to, in response to Kelly Armstrong, I did bid for additional money for sports and didn't get it. So I got two million of the four million that I bid for. And what I will do, and will commit to you and other members who are here and listening, I will keep continuing to try and put money into sports, given the fact that a lot of the work with grassroots has been crucial, particularly through this COVID period. Uh, and again, someone asked me a question about food parcels. A lot of sporting or organisations in, in my constituency and others were right in the middle of ensuring that our most vulnerable were protected. Mr. Nesbitt? And I, I thank the Minister for that, but you know, given the fact that both sectors are province-wide, that they've got elite performers as well as grassroots performing in venues of various shapes and needs, a discrepancy of 33.2 million, you would agree, Minister, is not acceptable? Well, if there are further Barnet consequentials to come from sport, which I anticipate they will, then sport will get that. But I do think it's a bit disingenuous to say that um, first of all, that I have created that imbalance, or indeed our executive colleagues haven't created that balance. No, and, and I'm glad you're not saying that, but there is a big disparity in terms of figures. Um, so, yeah, I will continue to try and bid for additional funds for sports. I'll also continue to um, get additional funds for arts, because let's be honest, um, and the member will know this, even from his own experience, that. Any recovery for the economy has to include people like our artists, our creative industries and all the rest. But also we've all enjoyed our sporting athletes, both on an international and local stage and even some of our grassroots groups, and they too need our support. So I will recommit again to try and get additional money into sports wherever I get it and look forward potentially to any more border consequences coming for sport. Mr Gordon Dom. Well, Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for her statement today. Uh, you mentioned about sport, and Minister, you will be very much well aware of the sp local sports clubs. Uh, there was a previous scheme, and a large number of them missed out on that. There was a short lead-in time, there was limited funding. Can you give us assurance that um, more clubs will be included in the next round of funding? Well, uh, the Member may already be aware of this, but um and certainly his colleagues on the Committee's Committee, along with the rest of us at the time, did express disappointment to Sport and I about the way in which the hardship fund was managed. First of all, people didn't get to know about it until the last minute, and then it was a scramble. Not a scr I don't mean that in a derogatory way, but there was a rush to try and get their applications in, and a lot of them were extremely disappointed and remain extremely disappointed. So I want to try and get more money into those groups as possible, and hopefully, this £2 million that I received in June monitoring will help go some way to alleviate their pressure. Mr. Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister. Will the Minister encourage small clubs, especially, to work with Sport NI and any future funding? Will she give us an assurance that it is um, spread equally across all sporting clubs and not just a, specific, a few specific organisations? Um, well, the answer is yes, but we also need to look at the reality that between soccer, rugby and GAA makes up of over 80 per cent of participation in sport. So um, you can't give um, a lesser, uh, not a lesser sport, but people who don't attend in the same numbers to those other three codes, the same amount of money because it wouldn't be fair. However, I do think that the member is right in saying that those small groups need funds as well, regardless if they're not involved in the big three, they need help as well. So I am committed, you know, for example, we've got boxing, we've got MMA, we've got gymnastics, uh, we've got Rome, we've got all sorts, all of which, you know, have seen medals uh, in different international competitions. But even beneath all that, we still need to be like, we've got walking clubs, we've got all sorts, and we do need to try and get them some support. There goes my bid for funding for Ravenhill Presbyterian Indoor Bowls Club. Emma Rogan. 
Principal Deputy Speaker, and I'd also like to thank the Minister for her statement today. Ensuring everyone has some um, form of accommodation throughout this crisis has been a major positive step in the midst of this global pandemic. Can the Minister outline today what steps she will continue to take to, to continue this trend in the future? Thank you, Mama, for a question. I think we, we can all say with some pride that, although pride, it's a mixture of pride and shame, really, that because of uh, the COVID pandemic, uh, we didn't have anyone sleeping in the streets in our towns and villages. But to be frank, they shouldn't have been there in the first place. And we all need to make sure they're not there again. Um, because I hate this term, rough, you know, rough sleepers. It's obviously by someone who's never slept on a cardboard box on a shop front. So we need to make sure that those, the, the, there's proper and appropriate accommodation for people for all sorts of reasons who find themselves homeless. And regardless of have an addiction or not, they're entitled to a bed and they're entitled to a dress, and we will make sure they get that. We know the negative impact um, COVID has had and will continue to have on our hospitality and tourism sector. I welcome the steps um, already taken by the Minister, um, some of which she's outlined in her statement today. The much needed reform of the liquor licensing laws um, would be welcomed by the sector at this time. Can you give us an update and when do you plan to bring forward um, this legislation? Um, well, liquor licensing, we again discussed it today and we're hopefully going to try and get it resolved as soon as possible. Um, I think liquor licensing has been about DSD and DFC for a long time. Um, there's been loads of consultations on it, loads of reviews. We just need to get it over the line and I'm sensing that we're nearly there. So hopefully we'll be able to make an announcement soon on what the outcome is. Mrs Paula Bradshaw. Um, Principal Deputy Speaker, and, um, Minister, apologies, I was at Health Committee, that's why I missed your statement. Um, I would like to um, ask you a question around the, the money that was announced from the Treasury for the arts. Um, and it just was more of a commitment at the start, given the urgency uh, of help needed for the arts sector. And it would be if you could allocate that funding before the September monitoring round so that they can get the preparations underway and the money spent before the end of March this financial year. Um, well, first of all, we, we, we did cover it, so, um, and it was covered earlier, but we, we want to try and get the money out as soon as we can. We need to we ensure that as many people within the arts and cultural sector and the heritage sector are supported as possible. It is a substantial amount of money. Um, the member will be aware that other groups, some groups, have said it isn't enough, but it is a good start. Um, but certainly my priority will be to get it out as soon as possible, and my priority will also be to try and help those musicians, freelancers, artists who didn't get access to public funds, albeit the Universal Credit Discretionary Funds, as a result of this crisis. They are living in dire straits and they need our support. Mrs. Bradshaw. Um, thank you, Minister. That, uh, thank you for that commitment. It's really just about the, the broader and longer term issue there. You'd mentioned the word recovery around the arts. I'm just wondering, are you going to put together a specific plan for the recovery of the arts? Um, well, the we will be looking at, um, so I'm going to have a meeting fairly soon with a lot of people involved in the arts sector who have come forward with, ide with ideas about recovery. So I want to bring them together. I'm aware that there's strategies out there. I'm aware that there's reviews and plans, but a lot of them are disjointed. Um, so we just need to bring them together. We need, whether there's agreement or not, we need to get something done. Um, so yes, I am aware, and, I'm, and I've also said but when you weren't in the chamber that uh, arts and culture and creativity have to be part of any economic recovery. They absolutely must. They're just as important as hotels and bars and restaurants and all the rest. We need to ensure that they're supported also. Mr. Harry Harvey. Well, Deputy Speaker, <coughs> thank you, Minister, for your statement. With the announcement of allocation of lifeline support and funding for the arts, could the Minister give assurance that the money will be distributed fairly, reflecting the need for help in different areas going forward, being mindful that the theatre's box office losses will be in the region of £25 million, and the reopening of theatres will be difficult due to social distancing requirements? Um, I thank the member for his question. And uh, I'm assuming when he, meant, when he spoke about different areas, he meant different geographical areas, and he may have got some assurance that I am aware that, and I am a Belfast girl, as you know, but um, a lot of people have concern that this will be built, a lot of the bulk of this will be spent in a few theatres in Belfast. Um, I'm going to look at it right across the board. 
So, uh, because we did make public investment right across the board and we need to sustain that investment. And the people who live in those areas also should be entitled to have an expectation to go back to see their favourite musical play, um, drama, whatever it is. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I would also have concerns, Minister, for our museums. And an example would be the Folk and Transport Museum not far from here. Can the Minister assure me that these visitor centres will also be catered for? Thank you. And again, um, the member may have seen the five-point recovery plan from the executive. Um, and museums and libraries put different dates in because it is an operational issue for them. Um, they know what they need to do, and we need to give them the respect and the space to do that. Um, and they too are looking, depending on what way they're organised, both indoors and outdoors, what expectations. So they're, they're, they, they need to do that because they also need to try and get them open as soon as possible and ensure, to ensure their budgets are protected. Mr. John O'Dowd. I welcome the, the Minister's extensive statement, and it shows that when a Minister, or, or in this case Ministers, uh, identify legislation or policy in their departments which are a problem, they move forward and change them. And just on that point, in relation to the debt recovery, which, uh, which was suspended during the worst of the crisis, now that's going to return, can the Minister set out for us uh, what measures uh, she's going to put in place uh, for the months ahead? Thank you, Member. First question. Um, so the debt recovery was suspended, I said it in a statement, for about 90,000 people for a three-month period. And there were some people who wanted to continue their payments. Uh, there were also many people who couldn't. So there were in line when measures were brought forward by DWP, but there was uh, a suspension on the, base, on the basis that it would recommence two days ago, or three days ago. So that's, that's happening. Um, and it will be done in a manner which doesn't put people into any more pressure and it will be done with their advisor in their office to ensure that they can meet the commitments that they've made, even if it means going back to the original agreements that they made. Mr O'Dowd. Okay. Mr Matthew O'Toole. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. As the Minister will see, um, I'm wearing a mask today. Um, and though it's slightly awkward and I felt slightly self conscious coming into the chamber, I think it's really important that we all start to get used to wearing masks. Um, tomorrow, they'll become mandatory on public transport in Northern Ireland. So, can the Minister advise us whether she is having discussions about either making face coverings mandatory or at least issuing guidance to some of the many sectors that her department covers, whether that's arts and heritage venues, which will be hopefully opening soon, whether that's local council premises, or indeed whether it is benefits offices. So she, can she advise on whether she is preparing guidance around face coverings? Well, I have worked with the member's colleague, Minister Mullen, um, and other executive colleagues on the, the mandatory wearing of face coverings on public transport. Uh, I visited the Jaws and Benefits office in East Belfast the other day and looked at the social distancing measures that they're putting in place. Uh, and some of the members will need to wear face masks or face, not masks, but certainly face coverings, which in could include visors, depending on the, the, the close proximity they need to work. So the answer is yes, but we're taking lead from all our ALBs on what they feel is appropriate. And we're also working with our trade unions and their staff side representatives to ensure that they are protected in the recovery and coming out of this process as well. Thank you for the Minister for that answer. Um, just further to it, um, and going back to what we've been discussing around the arts sector and the, and the welcome support that she's, um, that she's going to be dispersing in the, in the coming weeks, Paula Bradshaw mentioned the need to have a, a long-term plan for the arts recovery sector. Would part of that plan be around a strategy for mitigation in spaces, including face coverings, including social distancing? So can she work on a comprehensive plan which joins up how you reopen some of those arts and cultural venues while also making them safe? Uh, and dispersing money for support that should be one joined up process, as it were? I think, that's, I think it's reasonable. I think it's a reasonable ask. Um, the Arts Council also need to issue guidance and work with certainly big venues and open spaces or even indoor spaces or ensuring that people are protected. And that may mean wearing face coverings. So I think that's fair enough. Mr. John Stewart. 
Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for her statement and for the work that she's been doing and her department uh, thus far. Uh, Minister, you'll no doubt be aware that COVID-19 has posed particular problems for individuals suffering with gambling addiction or gambling disorder. Uh, the Gambling Commission in Great Britain, which doesn't operate here, conducted a survey in England, Scotland and Wales recently during COVID to say that 60% of those who identified themselves as at-risk gamblers saw an increase in their activity online during that period. That is deeply worrying. Um, and I have no doubt if we conducted a survey here, we would see a similar result, if not worse. Can I ask, conscious of the fact that it is a cross-department issue, but one that does fall under your remit, what is your department doing to monitor the amount of activity of, of problem gamblers and how, what more can we be doing as, as an assembly and an executive to help them? Thank you, Minister. Thank the member for his question. And it was Robin Newton raised it um, in depth yesterday at the committee. Um, I mean, I have no jurisdiction over online, and the member, I know the member will be aware of that, and he's absolutely right, that particularly during this, which is actually harder to regulate, but particularly during this crisis, um, the evidence and the concerns and the experience, particularly from people who are working with those with addictions, have said that there has been an increase. Working with young people and families, there has been an increase in online gambling, and that's really, really worrying. And certainly, as part of the legislation, uh, under the consultation, um, these were things that people were really concerned about, the increase of online gambling, and there is a need for regulation. Uh, I do think, um, certainly, when you're looking at vulnerable people, but particularly children, as an industry, there needs to be greater responsibility. And some of the legislation was brought forward in England, when I looked at it, it wasn't strong enough. So whatever we bring forward needs to include that level of strength and level of prevention to, um, I suppose, put off people become addicted to gambling. Mr. Stewart. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her response and I agree wholeheartedly and appreciate that. If I pivot quickly then to just another issue that you raised in the statement that around sports clubs and sadly, uh, granted while some did get support, many missed out. Um, these are at the centre of our community and um, also have massive outdoor spaces, whether it's our cricket clubs, which I'm a member of, or our GA clubs or football clubs, they have the opportunity to provide big beer gardens and places where people can socialise safely, socially distanced. Sadly, due to the restrictions on licence and laws, clubs are unable to sell alcohol outside, they can provide it. That is an anomaly that I think maybe could be looked at very quickly to give them the opportunity to maybe uh, maximise their ability to sell and social distance for their clients. Is that something that we could maybe look at? Well, certainly something that has been raised in the executive, um, to be fair, um, the difference between a wet and a dry bar. Right, OK. I thought they were all wet bars, like, but there you go. I think it's in relation to the provision of food, but there is an anomaly. Um, I don't want to preempt any discussions, but certainly we're aware of it, and I'll try and bring forward your concerns. And sports clubs and private clubs um, are involved in those discussions as well, because that's how they sustain their own premises. I call Ms. Claire Bailey. Thank you, Chair. Um, thanks to the Minister, and I do agree with the Minister that um, 33 million for the arts and creative sector um, is nowhere near enough, no matter how welcome at this time. And it's because of this that uh, the Music Venue Trust and other organisations who work through real grassroots music venues, such as the OES Centre in Belfast and the Nose in Derry City, um, have expressed serious concern that these venues are going to be lost to us forever if we don't do what we can to save them and the vibrant community that they, they help. So can the Minister give us any indication that um, we can commit to some sort of ring-fenced um, financial assistance to save these venues? I, I can't commit to ring-fencing for those venues or any other um, at this stage, uh, to be totally honest, because I think if you make a commitment to ring-fence one part of this at the detriment of another, you'll have the same argument. What I will make a commitment to the member is that I am completely aware of the concerns and the points she's made um, and those venues will also not operate unless we have the creatives and the artists and the groups and the bands and the acts back. Um, but those artists and those venues have been hit really, really hard during this period. So that's what I make my commitment uh, to her and indeed to this house, that I will try as best as I possibly can to get them as much support as I can, not only through this announcement, but potentially through executive colleagues and other funding measures that are out there. Ms Bailey. 
Thank you. And maybe following on from that, then obviously here in Northern Ireland, we have a long history of underinvestment and indeed in year funding cuts to the arts sector. Um, we have the lowest levels of funding across these islands, and that should be to our shame. Um, so when we're talking about the creatives, the artists, the freelancers, Minister, what can we do to encourage these talents and artists not to leave the sector because they find it so impossible just to pay their bills, not just now, but for years? And what I think is shameful that even through that contribution that once was the Tory government mentioned, to have cut the block grant, including arts, for decades. So that's, that's what we're dealing with. And we're also dealing with a mindset of people, not yourself, and certainly not others, who think arts is a luxury, that they don't contribute to mental health, that they don't contribute to the economy, that they don't contribute to the sustainability of families. But let's be clear about where the cuts have came from. And also let's be clear, if we're serious about sustaining the economy, then we have to absolutely include our arts and cultural package as part of that. Can't talk about tourism, we can't talk about revitalisation of towns and cities and economies if arts and culture aren't part of that. And we can't expect artists to perform for nothing because it's good for tourism and people need to start paying up. So I absolutely agree with you, but I also want to make sure that she and other members are clear where the gap has been for decades and will continue under this regime. Mr Jerry Carroll. Thank you, Mr. Minister's statement. I was in the Health Committee uh, as well. Um, hopefully, my question hasn't been asked. Uh, but in relation to PIP decisions, um, a lot of people, the Minister will be aware, uh, in my constituency and her own, are still waiting on uh, decisions around uh, appeal dates, appeal decisions to be made. That has been exacerbated, obviously, with the coronavirus pandemic and lockdown. Is the Minister aware of any plans to address this backlog and recruit more staff into the appeal service and the department more generally to try and uh, address this uh, issue? Um, well, I, the member may have got it today, but he'll be getting it soon. I've answered several of his, part, his you know, AQWs around this, and he's right. Um, particularly, there does need to be um, a bit more focus on the appeal service, particularly because anybody getting to that stage are already sick and vulnerable. They're already going through a lot of stress. The length of time it's taken is quite long. It's taken an awful long time for their um, application to be assessed, and if it's appealed, it's taken a longer time again. And I personally think that's unacceptable. Mr. Carroll, uh, I thank the minister for a reply. I look forward to uh, reading the replies as well that has been issued uh, to to me. Uh, in regards to the upcoming uh, PIP review, I understand it may not be her, it may be Minister Hargey um, involved in the process. But is she aware that uh, looking into the uh, actions of Capita and ATOS are going to be part of that review into PIP? Um, I know the PIP review. Um, there's already, I think it's Mary Kavner, who's really well known to a lot of people within the community, has taken that forward. Um, I think Minister Hargey already, if she didn't do it by a statement, she certainly did it in publicity, that she wants to look at the potential for in-house facilities when contracts run out. Um, and it's not to be disparaging to the individuals who work within those organisations. However, however, there have been a scary amount of appeals of decisions that have been overturned. So there's something wrong and we need to fix it. Thank you, Minister. That concludes questions on the statement. Agenda item three is the time, date and place of our next meeting. We have yet to receive confirmation from the executive about when ministers will next come to make a statement to the committee. As soon as that confirmation has been received, written notification of the time, date and place of our next meeting will be issued to members in the usual way. I want to remind members that a plenary sitting of the Assembly is scheduled to take place on Tuesday the 21st of July and that ministers may continue to make oral statements to the Assembly on sitting days. That concludes this meeting of the Ad Hoc Committee. The meeting is adjourned.